Dear medical faculty, uh, staff, and students at the University of Nicosia Medical School, I would like to welcome you to our first of a series of inaugural lectures for this academic year. For those of you who do not know me, my name is George Segalidis and I am the Director of Communications at the Medical School. Some logistics before we start the presentation. Somewhere on the top of your uh, right, on, uh, right corner of your screen, you will notice an icon that you can uh, touch or click uh, depending on what device you're using. And um, you change the format and the way that you would like to view this presentation. In addition, in addition, you must have noticed that you are muted, and this is something that should not worry you. Uh, there will be a 15-minute Q&A session at the end of the presentation, and uh, you can place your question uh, in the Q&A box, uh, which you can find on the right bottom of your screen. I would now like to uh, ask our professor of obstetrics and gynecology, Sir Arul Kumaram Sabaratnam, to, int to introduce our speaker for tonight. Good evening. Thank you very much, George, for the kind introduction. And it is my great pleasure to invite you all for the inaugural lecture. First, I should pay my respect to the rector, deputy director, and the executive dean of the medical school, Professor Andreas Lampos, and others who are joined from the faculty, like Peter McCrory, Adonis Arnides, and so forth. And also to the rest of the staff and the students, most welcome. So it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Edmund Neal to give his inaugural lecture. Now, we call him Ed Neal for short, but he's a, was a consultant obstetrician and gynecologist. He was first appointed as consultant to Bedford Hospital NHS Trust in 1992. He qualified from St. George's Medical School in London in 1982, and then undertook postgraduate studies in Leicester and the famous University of Nottingham. From there, he went to China, to, sorry, to Hong Kong, China now, to teach at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And since his appointment from Bedford Hospital, he was clinical tutor, divisional director, then medical director for nearly eight and a half years. He has special interest in neurogynecology, but he will be talking generally about medicine today. Now, he is well fit to be the professor of clinical education in the University of Nicosia based on the number of posts he has held. As you could see, he was the Royal College District Tutor at Bedford, then he became member of the examination committee, he was examiner, then he was vice chair, chair, and also he was advisor for the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges. And when we formed the new part three examination, he was chair of that committee too. And as you could see from the picture with me, he's uh, really a strict examiner, kind-hearted man, but very strict. And because he must appear strict, he wears these uniforms, as you could see. And the second picture is there with Dr. Michael Murphy and Stephanie. I call them the partners in crime to conduct the exam well. And they always do very well. And we're all grateful from the Royal College for his uh, great services. Not only he has held educational posts, but managerial posts, and currently he's the chair of the clinical education for USA and UK for the University of Nicosia Medical School. But as you could see, he is well fit to do this because he has been clinical director for trauma, orthopedics, urology, and vascular services in Bedford Hospital. Now, I put the picture of St. George's Medical School from here where he started, and the University of Nicosia Medical School where he is functioning now. So it's a great pleasure to have Ed with us. The topic he has selected is quite interesting, from Chinese herbs to Swedish mesh. So wherever he goes, he explores different medicine. And I was told that it is Chinese herb medicine behind, but he will tell you it is not so. Uh, but you can see that he wears the appropriate uniform wherever he goes to make sure 
that is allowed into the medicine cupboards in different countries. So it is my great pleasure to introduce Ed Neal to talk about From Chinese Herbs to Swedish Mess, Observations of Medicine Over Four Decades. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Um, I'm, I, I am uh, very honored that you were happy to give the uh, introduction for me. Um, oh, sorry, apologies. Um, I am very grateful to the rector and deputy rector uh, of the university um, for the honor of um, uh, giving in, in, in conferring the title of professor on me. Um, and I'm also very indebted to the executive vice dean, Professor Sarambolos, um, for not only the offer of work in my retirement, um, but also the opportunities that it has given me. I hope that today uh, I will be able to um, I hope that today I will be able to show you some of the uh, experiences I have had over the nigh on 40 years of my career. And I sincerely hope that um, in doing this, I will not only to a degree entertain you, uh, but stimulate you to think uh, without boring you with too much detailed obstetrics and gynecology. Um, Errol kindly showed a picture of the new, the new latest St. George's. Well, this one was taken a few years before I started, but not too many, it would seem. Um, the horse and cart gives away the fact that Hyde Park Corner was not quite as busy then as it is now. But when I was a student, I was happy to cycle around it. Now, uh, I'm frightened going around it in the car. With it being Christmas, I hoped... I had hoped to, to give you 12 lessons and carols. Some of you have heard me sing and will be grateful that I'm not going to. Um, but I, I do hope to leave you with a few lessons from the past that I think may be relevant in the, in the future. So what have been the major changes that I have observed over the past 40 years? Well, certainly the way we select medical students has changed. Um, my view of UK students that I would saw much closer before I retired um, and the attempts made by my own children and friends, children of friends to get into medicine show me very clearly that in this day and age I would never have even got short, been shortlisted to, um, to attend a medical school. In my day I went to, I applied to two London medical schools. London medical schools, uh, there were 12 London medical schools in those days. Uh, and if you played rugby, you got in. I actually had one interview, not at St. George's, that was 15 minutes discussing rugby in England's chances, followed by an offer because they were short of front row forwards for the following season. Uh, and that is the absolute truth. So student selection has changed. Students are picked by their schools in the UK at the age of 13 and 14 as being potential medicine material. And they're groomed and guided to the detriment sometimes of their social skills to become the, the potential medical students of the future. I think perhaps the pendulum has swung too far and I will come back to that later on. But I think that that the days of the characters in medicine is perhaps going. Whether there is a place for characters is another question. But the days of the rugby playing, cricket playing, um, medical students who will walk across the, um, the Arctic wastes um, may well be long gone. I think we've changed the way we teach. We te teach systems. We teach all, the student all they need to know about the systems and the problems and how the problems and the medical, prob medical conditions relate to the systems. I'm not 
100% convinced when I talk to the students of today. And it may be just that they have forgotten what they learned in the first two years. But I am not convinced that they truly have the building blocks, the basic understanding that we had when we were students. We've certainly reduced experience. And I will come on to that later. And we now drive medicine through guidelines and protocols, which should be very different, but in modern medical parlance are often not. Unfortunately, I also think that there is, particularly in obstetrics, there is a clear drive to defensive medicine, a risk aversion that is not, not only evident in society, as we see from the from current experience with COVID, but is also evident within medicine that we are fearful of getting something wrong. And finally, we have to manage patients, we have to practice medicine in an atmosphere of expert patients, some of whom are very much experts. They know all there is to know about their condition or conditions. Others are experts as trained by the internet. And of course, the media who never let the truth get in the way of a good story. So to begin my 40 years, um, I thought I would show you this picture. Um, Aral has kindly um, mentioned that I was in Hong Kong. This I can tell you, and, and for those of you that understand the history of Hong Kong, this was a picture, is a picture from the late 80s or early 90s. You can easily tell that, because we are taught to observe as medical students, the China Bank Building was the tallest building in Asia when this photograph was taken. And it was made the tallest building because they put an aerial on top, the shape of two rugby posts. That building is still there, but there are no tall buildings on the Kowloon Peninsula. This is taken from Hong the peak in Hong Kong. There are no tall buildings because Kai Tak Airport is st was still open. And that straight line coming along there is the runway going out into the harbour. This is the Prince of Wales Hospital where I was fortunate enough to work. Fortunate for two reasons. One, I got fantastic clinical and research experience, but two, and at the time when I first arrived, far more important to me, it was the only air-conditioned government hospital in Hong Kong, and it was a great relief when we arrived in May facing a long, hot, humid summer to have to keep a jumper at work to stay warm. My research in Hong Kong, my main research was on the use of acute phase reactants. Back in the mid 80s, the triple test for the uh, assessing the personalized risk of uh, Down syndrome in obstetrics had only just been described, um, came from King's College Hospital. And we came up with the hypothesis that if we could do something similar for cervical cancer, we could perhaps significantly reduce the more, both the morbidity and the mortality of that disease. At this time, the uh, loop excision of the transformation zone had only just been described. And although we knew that papillomavirus and may be implicated in the transmission or causation of cervical cancer, we certainly hadn't um, worked out which of the um, subtypes of HPV were responsible. We did know, however, in Hong Kong, that where we saw a lot of patients with far more advanced cervical cancer than we saw than I left in the UK, we did know when we talked to and audited the patient, the women as they came in, that whilst they were largely monogamous, on average, their partners had made use of at least seven separate sex workers prior to the, their, their wives developing cervical cancer. So to us, this was a truly sexually transmitted disease. 
I have to say, and if you look for the papers that I wrote, there were very few of them. I achieved a grand total of very little. Acute phase reactants as a panel for the um, prediction of risk of, of cervical cancer was and remains a complete waste of time. It kept me occupied for two years, but that was it. But I did learn a lot about acute phase reactants. C-reactive protein and haptoglobin were both raised, but that was all I could tell you. We, they, we couldn't use them to predict cancer because they were so nonspecific. What worries me now, in many ways, is that C-reactive protein, in particular I see used by junior doctors, by trainees, as a measure of infection rather than as a measure of inflammation. And whilst infection will cause inflammation, and it is a non-specific um, response that it creates. And many is the time that I've done a, a ward round and said to a patient, said to, about a patient, I think this lady can go home. The trainees respond by saying, well, Mr. Neal, we don't think she should go home because the CRP is still significantly raised. To which I have responded, look at her. She's sitting up in bed. She's eating and drinking normally. She's voiding and opening her bowels. Her pain has gone. She's getting better. She can go home. She will sort her biochemistry, her bloods out herself. And I think there is a great danger, if we're not careful, to forget the patient, to only look at the results. So the first of the few smaller, not 12 lessons that I'd like to leave you with, is look at the patient, not the results. Trichoxanthin is a Chinese medicinal herb used in traditional Chinese medicine as uh, an abortifacient. It induces abortion. And it's the active chemical that is extract, can be extracted from the Chinese herb Tianhua Fen. It was originally used, as I say, in China long before the one child policy um, to, to limit the number of children in a family. And it was um, purified for use in terminations of pregnancy and potentially to, to, for use with ectopic pregnancy. I was involved in research into trophoblastic disease, which, as I'm sure you're all aware, is far more common amongst Chinese peoples than it is amongst Europeans. And we found quite clearly that the effects of the standard chemotherapy that we would be using for in particular choriocarcinoma, but also for persistent trophoplastic disease, were more than enhanced by the addition of purified trichoxanthin in vitro. I left Hong Kong before any in vivo experiments took place. But I find it interesting because I have followed the use of this herb since. One of the issues, because it's a protein, is that it can induce uh, uh, an immunological response and an immune reaction and an, and an allergic reaction. However, it is now in regular use to suppress the immune response in HIV and inhibit HIV disease progression. And more recently, it has come back to our own profession, obstetrics and gynaecology, where it is now being tested to assist with um, scar pregnancies. As the, the incidence of caesarean section rises across the world, um, the risks of a placenta implanting over that uh, scar from a previous caesarean increase, and that increases the risks of placenta accreta and percreta. Just by way of example, um, months before I retired from the NHS full time, uh, a record that had stood of mine, a personal record that had, that had stood of mine 
for 27 years um, of regarding postpartum hemorrhage was broken. When I was called back in to assist uh, with the lady who had placenta percreta in a previous cesarean section scar, and she beat my record by two days uh, when she had a 26 unit of blood transfusion to save her life. She left ITU within 48 hours and was discharged home within another two days. So anything we can do to um, assist with the management of these very difficult pregnancies as the demands of patients and our own risk aversion increases, the risk of the incidence of cesarean section will help. So the second lesson, therefore, is that historical use does not necessarily predict future uses. This is Victoria Falls. This is a bridge that was built. It's a photograph from the uh, 19th century of a bridge being built over Victoria Falls, which reminds me perfectly of a TBT. The gap in the middle is the urethra. The mesh underneath is the TVT. The Swedish mesh, the Swedish mesh which took over a significant proportion of my consultant clinical life. Stress incontinence is a real problem. It affects significant proportion of all women and in fact it ranges from about 5% in 17-year-olds to up to 70 to 80% in care homes. Traditionally, I was trained to do a colpo suspension, but in the late 90s, mid to late 90s, the mid-urethral sling or TVT was introduced. It was specifically designed to be adjusted to the patient's needs and therefore had to be put in under local or, gen or regional anaesthetic. I learnt from Ulf Ulmsten in Malmo who is, who is credited with inventing the procedure. I put in during the course of the following 20 years after I learnt it well over 500 TBTs. And when I audited the first hundred with two to five year follow up, not only were well over 70% completely dry, but 94% of those patients would firmly recommend the operation to a friend. It was a difficult learning curve. It was a new procedure. It was unlike anything else that we were really doing in obstetrics and gynecology at the time. But by thinking about the process, I was able to get through that learning curve. When it came to the UK, quite rightly, we challenged ourselves to compare it to our existing procedure, namely the Birch Colpo suspension. And in a very large um, multi-center study led by two very preeminent uh, urogynecologists in the UK. Birch and TVT were compared. But TVT, if the patient was randomized to the TVT arm, there was no control over the training of the surgeon. And there was no control over the anesthetic that was used or whether it was adjusted or the tension was guessed. The outcome of that study was that the Birch and the TVT were equally effective, but obviously the TVT was far easier and quicker to put in and had a much quicker recovery of four weeks rather than eight weeks to the Birch Colpo suspension. It became the standard very quickly in the UK. At a time when urogynecology as a subspecialty was only developing, and many non subspecialists found it easy to put in, but not necessarily to put in properly. 
We soon found that the incidence of complications began to rise. But we did, didn't actually measure them properly. Not only that, in parallel with the TVT coming in, we had introduced, introduced mesh into gynecological surgery. In the mid-90s, many of the reps from the big companies would come to us and say, the surgeons are putting mesh into inguinal hernias, why don't you put mesh into the vagina? And many gynecologists did. Now to me, mesh in the vagina was a daft idea. You were stripping the blood supply to the skin to place a foreign body underneath it and then leaving the skin to gradually thin as the woman got further and further away from the menopause until such time as the foreign body came through the skin. Erosion was inevitable. So what succeeded, what then came about was a number of very serious and appropriate complaints and a campaign by the Daily Mail, one of the papers in the UK, uh, which led to a complete ban of mesh. Nowhere in the Daily Mail campaign did they try to differentiate between the successful TVT and the unsuccessful mesh for supported prolapse. And the end result now is that a significantly good operation has been largely taken away from patients because now they don't want it because of fear of um, erosion. And yet the erosions from TVT, in my experience, were largely poor technique. And most of the erosions from other people that I had to deal with were in the upper anterior fornices and almost certainly due to buttonholing of the needle through the vaginal skin at the time of insertion. The other interesting thing is that as we now return to put colpo suspension and an old man like me is welcomed back because I can teach people how to do colpo suspensions because I can remember them. Um, in parallel, we have had a, a series of periurethral injections. Not long before I started as a urology SHO, uh, they, there ended a short period of injecting Teflon into um, the urethra. Teflon had been used as an alternative to phenol, which just made a rock-hard urethra that wouldn't close the door open. It just sat there and patients leaked. Teflon worked really well because it was much more elastic, except it's, it migrated into the blood vessels and spread to the brain, causing trouble, so that was abandoned. We then injected collagen, which was wonderful stuff, except it had to be replaced every 9 to 12 months. Following that, we injected silicon, which was in lovely little beads, but was really only 50 to 60% successful and only temporarily. And now we have Vulcamid, a slightly different polyglucide hydrogel, but again, far less effective than colpo suspension or TVT. The lesson from this, just because you are a competent clinician in general, you cannot assume, assume that the, the clinicians will be competent in all things. And I think the, therefore, we have to be clear and honest with ourselves and our patients, what we're good at and what we are not good at. I'd now like to move to teaching and training. And we teach and we train at both the undergraduate level, the postgraduate level, and the lifelong learning CPD uh, for specialists who have completed their training. None of us have completed our training. We should be learning all through our careers. And I, am a, I have always been a firm believer that when you think you know all there is to know about something, is probably the time to stop doing it because you've probably just become quite dangerous. 
But over 40 years, textbooks have certainly given way to internet articles. I do worry about the trainees and the students of today. I have a, a line of books that I, are very precious to me on my shelf in my study um, that I can still look at and reminisce about and still learn things from. Um, and I don't think they are likely to ever have those. We lecture to them, but they, the students that I have met in the last decade or so wish to be spoon fed. Uh, one of the most important lessons I learned in my first year at medical school was how to study. I had learned everything by rote to get through my A-levels. There was so much to learn I had to understand it and be able to extrapolate from one fact to the next in order to get through the first year, particularly, I have to admit, biochemistry, which I tried to learn in a day and it didn't work. But Today, they don't seem to learn those lessons of self-teaching, self-learning. They expect to be taught. They expect us to tell them everything they need to know. They expect if there is an element in the curriculum that they need to know about, that it is their, their right to be told. And whilst I fully concur and agree we all took the Hippocratic Oath. We swore we would teach anyone who wanted to learn the art of our trade all they needed to know. But we can't train a cohort, an era of doctors who don't have an inquiring mind to either develop the new and innovative ways of the future, or to be able to think laterally and get themselves out of trouble when they find themselves in the middle of an operation or in a clinic with no support, because one day they will be working without support. I'm also concerned that we have gradually moved experiences up the grades. As a medical student, as a when I qualified, I could suture. We, we did all the suturing of the episiotomies on labor ward. Whether we did them well is another question. But on your first day on labor ward, the SHO taught you to sew up an episiotomy and the medical students did them all. So we learned to suture as students. We sutured in A&E, in casualty. I had put in chest drains, I had done a lumbar puncture, I had done, I had taken out somebody's piles, I'd done a hemorrhoidectomy. Um, we had put in our, we had taken arterial gases, we had, we could put in drips. All these things, our patients accepted, we had to practice and they allowed us to practice on them. Patients now don't like students practicing on them, they expect qualified doctors. And I can understand that. They equally expect doctors who are not only qualified, but experienced and know what they're doing. But no matter whether you do your first as a student, a foundation doctor, a trainee in their first year, a trainee in their fifth year, or a consultant, your first is your first. And if you have enough building blocks in place, you can build on your, your foundations and your experiences very quickly. If your building blocks aren't there, your confidence and your competence will take much longer to come. We also have to embrace changing technologies. Um, we have to embrace the technology of remote lectures. Um, as you saw at the beginning, that's not one of my best technologies for embracing. And I have to say, much, as an honor it is, much of an honor that it is to be talking to you this afternoon, it is, um, I find very difficult to not be able to see and get any feedback. We have to embrace this, but I do worry how far we have come from the days when I was taught 
of what was classically known as see one, do one, teach one, to today where we have a clear, clearly defined structured training and modules, but the doctors need to get the boxes ticked. So yesterday, a very, very good fifth year trainee said to me, um, can I come to your operating list? because I need to do an ablation for this year. And I said, well, yes, but don't you want to do another oper any, any of the other operations? She said, no, no, I need to do the ablation. I've got to get that box ticked. When she left me yesterday afternoon, she had done two posterior repairs, an abdominal hysterectomy, but she was still most pleased that she'd managed to get the one ablation she needed to do this year done and ticked. And I think we've got to instill in our trainees and juniors a change of attitude that they want, they, they need a desire to get as much experience as they can. Assessment has changed as well. In my day, assessment was subjective and time consuming. Um, we had vivas where consultants made things up as they went along. Um, it was well known. You, you were much better off being examined in the afternoon than in the morning because the examiners always had a couple of glasses of wine with a nice lunch and were far more mellow when they, when they asked you some questions. In fact, in the 70s and 80s, you could qualify not by doing an MBBS, but in London, you could qualify by taking the Worshipful Society of Apothecaries exam. And that exam was so old and steeped in tradition that it wasn't just the examiners that drank alcohol, but the candidates and the students were offered a glass of sherry before the viva. We've moved to assessment that is objective. It is repeatable. But there is a great danger with that, that we test what we can rather than what we want to. We have to make sure that we can test what we need to test. We can test those soft skills, communication, um, information gathering, the ability to listen, as well as the ability to speak, um, and professionalism. The things that make up a doctor that, it, that 40 years ago it was assumed we could do, rightly or wrongly, we now, because of the issues, the doctors where it has not happened, we now have to test it. But I am not sure that we openly and clearly teach it. I think that professionalism, I think that communication, and I think that information gathering are elements that, to a large extent, are presumed the student will pick up from us as teachers through their time with us. And I don't think they are, because they are so blinkered in their view of getting the boxes ticked and the various subjects done, that I don't think they are being taught that. And therefore, I don't think we are necessarily as fair as we should be when we are assessing them. We have to be careful, though, because medicine is not a black and white subject. Now, I'd like to talk briefly about guidelines and protocols. And with this COVID pandemic, um, there are times when I am sat at home, particularly now that winter has, has, has started, uh, and I leaf through the television. And I came across this film from the 1950s called Reach for the Sky, for those of you that have never seen it, Kenneth Moore plays the part of Douglas Bader, and it is the story of Douglas Bader, who joined the RAF in the early 20s, who was involved in a very serious accident, as a result of which he had both his legs amputated. And the film is the story of his fight to not only get back in an aeroplane, but actually to become one of the leading aces of the Battle of Britain, um, and it, finally, he was shot down over France uh, and ended up in Colditz prison camp. But within 
that film, and I never, I could, no matter how much research I did, I couldn't um, determine whether or not uh, it was a quote from Barda or a quote from the film Just. There is, they say twice, rules are made for the obedience of fools and the guidance of wise men. And that can be applied to guidelines in medicine very clearly. If you look at the Oxford English Dictionary, a guideline is defined as a directing principle, whereas a protocol is a formal statement of transaction. In other words, a guideline gives you the principles you should use for management whereas a protocol you should follow verbatim. Guidelines have exploded in the NHS in the last two decades, and whilst, whilst the National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence, Excellence is an absolute wealth of knowledge and has improved standards no end, um, one also has to bear in mind that the NHS Litigation Authority requires each maternity unit to have approximately 100, but they have to write them all themselves, check them all themselves, renew them all themselves, and basically every unit is now um, writing their own textbook. And these guidelines, not protocols, guidelines have turned medicine from grey to black and white, from a grey art to a black and white subject which suits the legal profession alone. Students and trainees learn them like textbooks. Lawyers read them avidly that they must be followed to the letter. But patients do not come with guidelines attached. Guidelines are just that, guidance. And there is a great danger that I see of our trainees and our students trying to fit the patient to the guideline rather than looking to where the guideline applies and where it doesn't apply. Because if, you, if it doesn't apply, you just need to document that it doesn't apply and why. So we cannot assume that guidelines are, are, proto are, are protocols. We cannot assume that they are synonymous. Lastly, I'd like to look very briefly at what we've learned from COVID-19. I'm not a virologist. I know nothing about virology, although out of the whole of the microbiology course uh, in the early, uh, late, eight, late, late 70s and early 80s at St. George's, virology was probably the bit that I learned the best. What, what it should have taught us is improved history taking. A telephone consultation is a perfect exercise in history taking. You have no, you don't even have the visual clues of, hist of taking a history with the patient in front of you. And yet, unfortunately, just as we moved from face-to-face -face clinics to telephone clinics, our students quite rightly were taken out of the hospitals away from the environmental risk of catching COVID-19. But unfortunately, that means that the better communication that follows the improved history taking, also, they were not there to witness. And what's happened now they've come back? They've come back as patients have come back. So that's an opportunity that is completely missed. Because most patients have to attend for investigation, I believe that it taught us better justification of our investigations. Not willy-nilly setting off the great favourite of the junior doctor, the pan-investigram. Do every test and hope it gives you the answer you would like, or one even that you haven't thought of. But actually, back to the old teaching. What tests do you need to do? And how will the answer change your management? It, will also, it has also taught us to think more laterally. We've had to think of different ways of doing things, of different possible diagnoses, 
of different approaches to patients in order to renew, reduce the risks of transmission. And included in that is the need to only perform necessary surgery. I challenge any sur surgeon to say that he has only ever performed necessary surgery. And certainly in obstetrics now, we know that maternal request cesarean sections are sanctioned by NICE, whether you agree with them or not. The patient has the right to ask for a cesarean section. If I don't think it's justified, although I can say I don't agree, I can't stand in her way of getting that cesarean section done. But we've had to go to traditional methods of operating. Laparoscopy and minimal access surgery was seen as aerosol generating six months ago. And therefore, we stopped doing it to reduce the risk of transmission. And we returned to doing open laparotomies for ectopic pregnancies, etc. And it was amazing the number of junior doctors who suddenly said, I've never done an open ectopic. I've only done them by, by laparoscopy. Please, will you teach me? I hope COVID-19 has reset patient expectations. Certainly when I undertook um, telephone consultations at the beginning, a number of patients, <coughs> excuse me, that's a dry throat, that is not COVID. A number of patients said, no, I've decided in the, the current situation, my symptoms aren't that bad, I don't want you to do anything. So hopefully we've reset patient expectations so that they are realistic about what we and the NHS can provide. I just hope we haven't rushed any research. I suspect we, we rushed the TVT Birch Colpo suspension research a little bit, and we rushed, certainly rushed the implementation of TVT, and we live to regret it 20 years later. As the UK begins its vaccination program next week, um, and my wife tells me that Tuesday she's been told she will start stabbing people because she gives the uh, current is currently giving um, flu vaccines and she's going to be transferred to the COVID vaccine. I hope we won't live to regret the rushed research, which has very successfully delivered three vaccines that will soon be available to us. So what are the lessons? Um, that we have, that I think that the, the last 40 years have shown us. Firstly, don't forget what we used to do in the past. The historical use of something does not predict what we might use it for in the future. Please, please, please remember, look at the patients, not the results. The patient is not a disease. The patient has a disease. The patient is not a disease. The patient is not the fibroids in the corner or the ectopic by the window. The patient is the lady with fibroids that we need to manage. Be honest about what you can and cannot do. If you're not good at something, be honest with yourself for the sake of your patients and be honest with your patients. Don't pretend you can do something that you know you will do badly. Please, please, please do not forget the benefit of experience. Trainees want to learn, students want to learn. We need to make sure we can give them as much as possible, particularly for those that have missed so many months of, of training uh, this year. And finally, please, please remember that guidance is guidance. It is an indication of the best way to manage a patient. It is not something that is hard and fast and written in stone, and the patient has to be forced into that box for management. I'll leave you with a couple of questions. Is medicine taught better now? Or is it just its component parts that we teach better? And how do we make sure we don't forget the lessons of the past, which will remain relevant today and in the future?
And finally, uh, as I enter this latest stage of my life, I leave you with one philosophical thought, which is that everyone needs time to enjoy life, enjoy children, and enjoy grandchildren. And as one of my friends who retired, set, took semi-retirement at the same time as me, said, you need a challenge. So he set out to paint 100 portraits in, in a year last year, last October, that I was number 96. Thank you very much. Right. Um, now, uh, we have, I believe, some questions. Um, now, I think I'm going to have to put my glasses on, I'm afraid, to see them. Um, right, so... Now, I've had a question here. Ah. Right, now then. Uh, I'm just looking to see if I can get into the questions. I can read that if you like. So I've got one here. Um, what so somebody, so a, I've had a question through here from um, May Maher. Mah I apologise if I get the, any of the pronunciation um, wrong. Um, and May is asking, um, trichosanthin suppresses immune response so it can be used as an immunosuppressant during organ transplantation. Um, to avoid rejection, and is the COVID vaccine considered rushed since they can't be sure of the long-term long consequences, or are they predicted? Well, I don't know whether the COVID vaccine is is or is rushed or not. Um, it has certainly come through the process very quickly in the UK. Um, I'm looking forward to the moment when I receive it, um, and I'm not frightened of having it. But only time will tell whether it was rushed or not. Oh. Now, I'm just looking here. Um, I've got a question from Victoria Basket. Um, how do you think the pandemic will change? Um, the conversation around elective surgeries with patients, i.e. what the doctor thinks is elective versus what the patient uh, thinks is elective. Um, I come from a background of urogynecology, um, and as a urogynecologist, none of my patients have a life-threatening condition. As I say to them, um, incontinence they may think they're going to die of embarrassment, but they're not going to die of incontinence. And so I have always said to the patient, these are the potential benefits, these are the potential risks. Only you know how bad your symptoms are. You decide whether or not you want the operation. Um, now, patients who are undergoing surgery for cancer, that conversation comes from a very different angle. That, that conversation is, this is what we can do, and this is the likelihood that we will successfully cure, manage, or give you three, five, ten years uh, good quality life in the future. I think and I hope that it will cause doctors and patients to reflect on those conversations. And actually, in the UK, we've had 
uh, I think it was the week before last, we've had new guidance on consent from the GMC. So we are all talking more in a very different way to patients about consent for elective and emergency procedures. Uh, because not all, all emergency procedures are even life-threatening. And um, for many years, we have had, patients have had to give informed consent for, consent, for instance, for emergency cesarean section. Now, is the patient able to give that consent if she has, prior to labour, said, I do not want a cesarean section under any circumstances or an epidural? And then when she is faced with the pain of labour and writhing around in agony, she says, give me my epidural now. I demand a cesarean section. Does she have the mental capacity or has that mental capacity been altered in such a way to make those decisions? You wouldn't withdraw the offer from her, but it does raise an interesting question. Um, so I've now had another, another question here from Alex Retsay. Um, do I feel that healthcare institutions have been politicised due to the corona pandemic? I don't think institutions have been politicised. Um, I think systems have. Um, and I think that the politicians have unfortunately put politics before healthcare. Um, if one takes the case of the United Kingdom, I am uh, conservative with a small c. I believe in the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Um, I believe in our elected government for Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And yet we also have devolved local government to Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales. Um, I think the politicians have spent a lot of time scoring, trying to score political points by saying we will look after our area um, and our, in the media our own politicians are criticised left, right and centre and yet if you look at the incidence of coronavirus across the four home nations, England has the lowest, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland are all significantly higher. So it does make you think that the politicians may say they have our, our, the the country's health at heart, and they are certainly doing many things correctly, but they are not taking a truly um, uh, high-standing approach and saying we will work together and do the best for everyone. Um, now then, next question here. Uh, this is from, oh, sorry, I've got to put the glasses on again, uh, Dennis Kayer. Um, in idealistic terms, it's correct to say that we should be providing more experience to students and trainees, but given, given the difficulty of the NHS in doing so, how should we practically implement this? Um, I think it's, it, 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 it's, it's very interesting. Um, there is a happy medium, and I think in the pendulum swing in medicine. Um, when I was a, a student and newly qualified, um, we did what was called a one in two, which was every other night, every other weekend, plus Monday to Friday, nine to five. It worked out around 100 hours a week. We were, we were at times exhausted. Um, I can remember one January, morning about 2 a.m. being called to casualty to see a patient, walking across the car park thing with my white coat on because we wore white coats, thinking, gosh, it's cold today. And there was frost on the ground and semi-melted snow. And as I looked down at the snow, I realized I hadn't got any trousers on. At which point I thought, perhaps I am very tired. So I went back, got some trousers before I went to see the patient. Those were the bad old days, um, and 
many doctors suffered because of it, and some patients. Now the trainees come in, do their shifts, they work 48 hours a week. They are far more uh, alert um, and they have a better work, much better work-life balance than we did. I enjoy my granddaughter because I didn't, wasn't around much to enjoy my children. And, but there are a lot of handovers and handovers create risk because I see a number of times where a patient is managed to get them to the handover so that they don't have to do something. Handover takes time so that the ball isn't picked up again for another half hour or an hour. The more handovers that you have, the more downtime you have during, during the working day. And also, I find that trainees, because their shift ends, they don't follow up on the referrals they made. They, they refer to surgery rather than talking to a surgeon. They refer to medicine rather than talking to a physician. Um, they refer and walk away. We talked and did it ourselves. There is a happy medium. Uh, there is a happy medium on ours. There is a happy medium on um, expectation. But equally, as technology improves, we are doing, in, in gynecology, we're doing less hysterectomies. Um, so there are less opportunities, and we just have to make the most of the ones that we have. Um, right, now I would say uh, that Paula Panova may well come from Hong Kong. Um, would I say that Hong Kong's medical system is better shaped than the European one? Um, Hong Kong's medical system was very different. It was based on the English system when I was there, but it was very different. Um, and by way of example, in 1989, the South China Morning Post did a review of the cost of a private hysterectomy across the colony of Hong Kong. And Hong Kong was about the size of London. In both in terms of land mass and population, it's just that only 10% of the land mass was actually livable on. Um, the cost of a hysterectomy varied, and it was about 100. I don't know. It varied from 10,000 Hong Kong dollars, which would be about a thousand pounds. It's about call it roughly 10 to one. Um, the university where I was working, we charged 12,000 Hong Kong dollars. And that went into our research fund and we could and traveling fund up to three hundred and sixty thousand dollars for the same operation. That is not a good medical system. Might be good for some of the private doctors, but it's not a good medical system. But you're dealing with a very different system. Um, my understanding of the medical system there now is that it is more privately aligned still than the in the UK system, um, a lot of the European systems have a much stronger private element to them than the government element. I personally believe in our NHS. Okay, so a first year student, um, May, oh, May again, has asked when, which year of her medical studies can she begin uh, research? Um, the answer is you can get involved in research if you talk to people that are doing it. You can get involved with helping and so on um, almost at any stage as long as it doesn't interfere with your studies. Um, I started my, my, my research at, at, at the end of my second preclinical -clinic, pre year when I took a year out to do cardiovascular and vascular research. Um, and do an extra BSc, which we were able to do um, back then. Um, so the answer is talk to the people, talk to your tutors, talk to your mentors, talk to people that are doing research. There will always be something small that you can get involved in. And if there is an interesting patient, they can always be written up. Right. Uh, just trying to see if there's any more that I can find here.
Um, are there aspects of, of modern teachers that I think are an improvement? Without a doubt, simulation. Um, our ability to, to teach by simulation is fantastic. Um, I remember very well uh, when I was a, an SHO, we had a medical student who couldn't put a drip in um, in Leicester. And I taught her to put a drip into me. Um, it was a big mistake. She really hurt me. Um, and what was really tragic was when I rotated back to the department two years later, she was my SA, she, she was my house officer, and she still couldn't put drips in. So it, all that pain that I went through was weighted. So simulation has been a huge improvement. Um, I think the other thing that I would say is that, that my teachers, some of them were interested, some of them weren't. There was no formal structure of training for teaching. Now we have a clear structure for training, which not only improves the teachers, the, 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 the university teachers, the formal teachers, but it also improves the informal teaching that you get from the trainees. In obstetrics and gynecology, there are modules within their um, MRCOG curriculum on teaching. So they have to learn to teach to pass their exams. We test their teaching skills before they become members of the Royal College. So I think we have, in terms of the formal training of teachers and simulation, we have certainly improved um, uh, our teaching skills. Um, now, I'm conscious that I've gone on 10 minutes, I think, longer than I should have done. Um, I think probably the, the, the last, I'm, I'm looking, I can see Errol and, and, and George on my screen. I'm looking at them now. Um, and I think probably the last question um, that I'll, I'll answer, uh, there's a lot, thank you, um, is what do I believe the future will be with the students' uh, current, current clinical practices? Well, I think the answer is uh, I have every faith that patients will be well treated. I have every faith that the students that we are now teaching, I know for a fact that the trainees, the postgraduate trainees that I have taught for the last 30 years uh, will never look after me, but the students may do. Um, and I have every confidence that they will look after me well. Um, I hope they will look after the finances well as well, and not waste money on me, not waste money on unnecessary investigations, um, but make sure that I and my peers are well looked after as we take up more painting and other hobbies as we grow older and move away from the sharp end of medicine to the receiving end. Um, Thank you all very, very much. Thank you very much, Ed, uh, for this excellent talk. I think it was a great pleasure listening to you. And I think the students have a number of other questions, but unfortunately, we don't have the time to go on for longer. But just to summarize all what you have said, I've made some notes for the students, not for the staff so much. First is commitment to what you are doing. So that is the first message which came out. Second was about compassion. Third was about competency, about how to be competent in doing something. Communication and imparting confidence in the, in the patients. And collaboration with the rest of the team, like the scientists and the nurses. And finally, cost effectiveness in practicing medicine, not to do all sorts of investigations. So, so I coined that into seven C's. Commitment, compassion, competency, communication, confidence, collaboration, and cost effectiveness. So thank you, Ed, for the excellent talk and for imparting this message to all who are listening to you. Have a great day, everybody, and thank you, George, for organizing this session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Errol.
Thank Just you. Just to mention that we had 90 participants in this session. Thank you all. Thank Have you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye to everybody. Bye-bye.